There lived a man so long ago, Count Gauntly was his name. His horror host abilities had brought him wide acclaim. The people flocked from miles around each Gauntly movie night, not knowing that the films he showed infringed on copyright. Upon discovering this fact and learning it was true, an angry mob of lawyers formed with pitchforks, torches too. They tracked the Count and sought to stop his movie hosting ways. And torches blazing put an end to Gauntly's earthly days. But our man was too resilient to let death be the last word. He stirred set up upon his slab and vowed he must be heard. So he stocked his tomb with gadgets from the local studio. Intent on showing movies on an awesome TV show. But he had to find a legal way, so Gauntly racked his brain. Was then he learned of something called the public domain. Now here he is, the time has come, his dreams are coming true. Count Gauntly's here to share a film in hopes that you won't sue. Hello and welcome once again to Count Gauntly's Horrors from the Public Domain. This is episode number 65, and we're heading into that time of year that Gauntly likes best. It's not too far from Halloween, but before our main celebration, we're planning a little pregame. Right? Yeah, and what better way to pregame your Halloween festivities than with some creepy cocktails? I'm with my friend, the projectionist here today, uh, now moonlighting as a bartender here in the crypt, because, you know, he's got a side hustle as Santa Claus, but it's not quite his time of year yet either. And so I throw a little work his way, and he's going to show us what he's got when it comes to mixology. You know, yeah, being Santa Claus doesn't always pay the bills, but um, when I've got this time off, why not use my holiday expertise for a different holiday? One of my other favorites, Halloween. All right. Let's see what he's got. Well, our first drink is going to be a witch's brew, which is a devilish blue concoction suitable for any witch's bacchanalia. Ooh, I like the sound of that. So we start with our martini glass here. You want to use some water, get the rim a little wet. Not too much. Then you want to take some black sugar. Just get the rim in there. Try to pick some of that sugar up. Get a nice coating on there. Oh, nice. Doesn't have to look perfect. Let's get that nice and nice and visible there. It's got that creepy black rind on there now. Very nice. Then you get your shaker out, and the main components of this cocktail are going to be vodka, triple sec, and blue curacao. So it's going to be one ounce of each of those. All right, you've been sampling okay. your product a little bit? Uh, just, just, just had a few today. Then a triple sec. And then for... Ooh, this is a key. Let's get a little nice color. visible on that. That blue curacao. Ooh. Oh, that's not the blue curse. That's not. I knew that. Uh, Wrong I color. I thought I did a color balance. That's there the it one. is. What'd you say the uh, name of this beverage is? It's the witch's brew. Much like a witch, we must concoct our own little brew here. The final ingredient is going to be the juice of a lime. Be very careful with this knife. Cut you. Yeah, just slice in there. Good, real good. And uh, oh, nice citrusy aroma. Yeah, smell that. And just squeeze that lime in there. It's good and hard. Just squeeze the life out of it. Squeeze it. Just really got to exert all that pent up aggression, especially when you're working around alcohol. <sighs> 
thing. Take your shaker. Make sure you get that lid nice and secure. Don't want any more accidents. Give it a good shake. Open up. Here's your black rimmed glass. Let's get a uh, strainer there. Oh yeah. Perfect idea. You can get the strainer over the top. Just all your ice there. Ooh. And there you have it. One witch's brew. It's looking pretty mystical right there. Do you care to sample it, Mr. Gutley? Give it a little taste. I'll say cheers to you. Mmm. Here is a colorless liquid that looks like water. It has a pungent odor and a burning sweet taste. Its chemical formula is C2H5OH. This is ethyl alcohol, the alcohol found in intoxicating beverages. It's made out of carbohydrates such as starch or sugar. Cereal grains are starchy materials commonly used in making alcoholic beverages. Out of wheat, beer is usually made. Beer contains about four and one-half percent ethyl alcohol, as shown by the striped area across the bottom of the bottle. And other products that contain sugar will be used to make alcoholic beverages. Out of grapes is made. Wine contains about 15 percent ethyl alcohol. All alcoholic beverages are products of fermentation. As these samples of wheat and grapes are fermenting, alcohol is being produced. The raw material usually needs to be prepared for fermenting or cracking or crushing. Whatever is being used, fermentation has to take place. Fermentation is the action of yeast cells on sugars to produce alcohol. The bubbles seen here are carbon dioxide given off during the fermentation. Beer and wine are products of fermentation alone. But whiskey, a third type of alcoholic beverage, requires distillation as well as fermentation. The alcohol is separated from the other materials in the fermented mixture. In this case, the alcohol is made out of fermented corn mash. When the fermented mixture is heated, vapors are given off that contain products of the fermentation, including a relatively high percentage of alcohol. As the vapors cool, they change to liquid and drip from the distillery. Whiskey ordinarily contains about 43% or more of alcohol. When we compare the three kinds of beverages, we see that whiskey contains more alcohol than either wine or beer. But in each of the three beverages, the intoxicating part is always the same substance, ethyl alcohol. By using animated drawings, we will see what happens to alcohol in the body. In the alcoholic beverage shown here, the black dots represent the ethyl alcohol content. The alcohol travels down the esophagus and into the stomach and the small intestine. Capillaries in the stomach lead into a branch of the portal blood vein that connects with the liver shown at the left. These capillaries absorb alcohol directly from the stomach and the portal vein carries to the liver. Other capillaries absorb alcohol from the small intestine, shown at the bottom. Portal vein carries so. In the liver, some of the alcohol undergoes an immediate change. Enzymes found only in the liver react with the alcohol and change it to acetic acid, and it here is white dust. This means that the alcohol burns or oxidizes. 
thereby releasing calories of heat energy. The acetic acid molecules and the molecules of ethyl alcohol, not acted upon immediately by the liver, pass on through the veins to the heart, shown here in the center. The more alcohol that reaches the liver at one time, the more alcohol goes on to the heart unchanged. The heart pumps this blood containing alcohol and the acetic acid into the arteries and on to all parts of the body. Whereas only the liver oxidizes pure ethyl alcohol to acetic acid, any body tissue, as for example, the tissue shown here, can oxidize acetic acid. As acetic acid represented by the white dots burns, heat energy is released and waste materials eliminated. Thus, the liver is the one organ of the body where oxidation of alcohol to acetic acid takes place. So except for small amounts of alcohol that escape through the lungs and kidneys, alcohol in the bloodstream remains unchanged until it can be acted upon by the liver. As the liver oxidizes molecules of alcohol to acetic acid, other molecules return from the bloodstream. The liver oxidizes about three-fourths of an ounce of alcohol per hour until the alcohol is all oxidized. As long as there is any alcohol in the bloodstream, some of it reaches the brain. Here it acts as an anesthetic. The effects of alcohol on the human brain vary somewhat from person to person, but its main effects follow a general pattern. At first, the greatest effect is on the cerebrum, outlined here with a black border. Five hundredths percent is about one ounce of undiluted alcohol in the entire bloodstream. This darkened area is the judgment center and the center for tensions and anxieties. Even small amounts of alcohol tend to deaden these centers, and because of this may provide an illusion of relaxation. This is ordinarily the situation in moderate social drinking. As the concentration of alcohol in the blood rises above 500%, the judgment center becomes more and more depressed, Gradually, too, the muscular control center becomes less responsive to incoming signals from nerves in all parts of the body. The person usually feels confident that everything is all right. But a condition like this develops. Drivers in this condition are incapable of making responses fast enough for the safety of themselves or others. This leads to accidents. The vision center, too, is affected during intoxication. This impairs the individual's normal vision. Blurring and other abnormalities of vision frequently occur. Driving or walking in traffic is extremely hazardous under such conditions. If the concentration of alcohol continues to increase, it finally affects a deeper center toward the base of the brain called the cerebellum. When the concentration of alcohol in the bloodstream reaches about four-tenths percent, unconsciousness usually occurs. Four-tenths percent is about eight ounces of undiluted alcohol in the entire bloodstream of an average-sized adult. Gradually, the brain and other organs are freed of the anesthetic effect of the ethyl alcohol. But even after consciousness is regained, it takes some time before the person is fully in control of his muscular processes. After deep intoxication, the sobering up period for an average sized adult may take 12 hours or more. Even beyond this amount of time loss, there frequently is a further period of partial 
incapacity. So we have seen that alcohol oxidizes in the body and produces heat energy. In this respect, it is like any other food. But as a food, heat energy is all that pure alcohol can provide. Most other foods supply some needed material such as proteins, vitamins. Pure alcohol contains none of these, even though it supplies calories. The substitution of alcohol for other foods over a long period of time produces serious nutritional deficiencies and decreases the resistance to infections and to such diseases as pellagra and beriberi. Those who are unable to avoid chronic overindulgence in ethyl alcohol, such as this man, are usually termed alcoholics or problem drinkers. For him, like other alcoholics, alcohol disrupts his life and injures his health. Investigations are convincing medical authorities that the problem drinker is a sick person. This man needs medical attention. The old method of treatment for a person in this condition was to throw him in jail. But the hospital is the place for a person in a helpless condition due to alcohol. Medical science can help the problem drinker regain his physical health. When there is any doubt as to the cause of the patient's condition, a complete medical examination must be made. An eye check will help determine whether the patient is suffering from shock. By means of chemical tests on a sample of his blood, the patient can be checked for diabetes and other diseases that may have symptoms similar to those of alcoholism. Blood pressure and heart tests will reveal the condition of the circulatory system. Physical tests and a study of the patient's history are needed in order to make sure that he is really suffering from alcoholism. Hospitalization for several days may be needed. During this time, he receives a balanced diet and is treated medically if necessary. Although he may recover physically, he must avoid all future use of alcoholic beverages. It's made clear to him before he leaves the hospital that even a single drink will certainly lead him back again to chronic alcoholism. It's essential that every drinker understand how alcohol affects his body and face the possibility of day becoming an alcoholic. And he should realize that alcohol is a potential menace to community safety as well as to his personal health. Well, okay, well, that was a pretty good film. Yeah. We're mellowing out here a little, you know, we had our first round, our magical witch's brew there. Do we have a garnish for that, by the way? Oh, yes. If you so choose, you can add a whimsical eyeball to your witch's brew. Just uh, float that on in there. Beautiful. Just get a little eyeball in there, a little Looks oculus. Accurate. That's right. Beautiful. All right, but now we're moving on. So what are we trying next? Our next cocktail is going to be called The Undertaker. And this is uh, a little more peppy. It's got some uh, coffee in it. So if you're ailing at the end of a long night, you get that undertaker to dig you up from your own grave. We'll start with our shaker. Get some ice in there. Then you want some uh, coffee liqueur. This is the sound I make when I go out for a night. And some creme de cacao. So I think the operative word with this one is dark. It's mm -hmm. going to come out very, very black. Because we want to have, you know, they say you got to eat a spectrum to have a healthy diet. You got to have a lot of color, some roughage, 
some uh, some vegetables and some bright blue and dark black alcohol. Vodka. So how many parts uh, are we working with? Like one one chocolate, one uh, coffee, three parts vodka maybe? Uh, yes, one of each of these and then three parts of the vodka. If you can get that in there. Then we have some chilled espresso and add one more part of that. That'll make sure it just gets nice and dark. Very dark. Once again, make sure your shaker is secure. Give it a good shake. Get out your martini glass here. And you strain that bad boy in there. Ooh. Easy does it. And there you have it, the undertaker. It'll pep you up before it puts you down again. Got a nice rich color there. Maybe not quite as black as we, we thought, but you can always add, you know, some more coffee, add some more creme de cacao. Just get it as dark as you want. Maybe you could even rim it with some of that black sugar if you wanted. Yeah. Add to the effect. So we're gonna dive into round two. I guess I'll take a little taste there. Could suck it up off the tablecloth at this point. <laughs> That's very sweet. Would you mind to sample that too? Oh, sure. You know, we're a sharing and caring crew down here in the crypt. Delicious. And peppy. And here is a peppy cinematic short for you guys at home. Enjoy. My name is Dr. Charles Wentworth. I conduct research in the field of physiology. The story you are about to see involves some facts about physiology, but it is more than a clinical report. It is a story that revolves around two seemingly unrelated articles, a good luck charm and an ordinary hypodermic syringe. It is filled with a colorless inflammable fluid with a characteristic odor and a pungent taste. You know it as alcohol. My research is devoted to alcohol and its effects on the human body. But not all experimenting is done in laboratories such as this. A certain amount of experimentation goes on under less scientific conditions. Jerry Landon is one such experimenter. Jerry Landon home from college for a vacation of fun and relaxation. After a while, well, we make bets. See, the guy that can tread the needle first after the most beers wins. And so who did? Well, Do you think he'd tell us if he didn't? Well, <laughs> you asked me what effect beer has, and I told you, on me, none. Jerry Landon is one of the types who experiments with drinking, the all-out type. Keith Stevens, on the other hand, is much more conservative. Hey, Keith, how would you and Mary like to go out to the lake tomorrow? What time? Early? Take a steak. Make a day of it. Think it over. Like to? Oh, Keith, I can't. I promise. Promise your mother you'd do something or another. How'd you know? Because you like to plan everything in advance. Nothing spur of the moment. Am I that bad? I didn't say it was bad. Just different from me, I guess. I like to let things take their course. What do you have? Beer? The Coke's all right. Coke and a beer. Uh -huh. Now there, I'll bet you planned that answer. If I was going to have beer, you were going to have a Coke, right? Well, maybe, but not just to be different. I plan not to drink because I plan not to drink. Hi. Hi. 
Made up your mind about tomorrow yet? Yeah, I'll go. Stag. His girl's got to be different. Same for you? I'll have a ginger ale. Me too. See, I'm not so different. Holy smokes, Dan. Here I go, building her up that she's being somebody different. Then you have to go order ginger ale. What gives? Here's what gives. The one and only car in the Parker family is in my keeping. And there's a rule of the house. No drinking and driving. Not even beer. Not even water. Ginger ale. Hi. Hi, Jerry. Let me see. My car keys? No, oh. the charm. Now, wait a minute. That's my lucky piece. It got me through history last term, and I'm counting on it to graduate me. <laughs> Can I trade you out of it? It looks to me like you have enough charm. It's not the bracelet he's referring to. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't have any like this one. <laughs> what do you say, Bev? Protect me. You better let her have it. She's got that collector's gleam in her eye. <laughs> well, there goes my luck. If I flunk out next year... It won't be because little Edie didn't plan it. She's a great little schemer. Hmm? How about another round? Not now. Uh, I think we better dance. That's it. Yeah. Come on, huh? Okay. Right, big dance. Okay. <laughs> I guess that leaves you, Jerry. Hold down the fort. slipped pleasantly away for the three young men and their dates. For Keith Stevens, who did some drinking, for Jerry Landon, who held down the fort, and for Dan Parker, who stuck to ginger ale. Here in the laboratory, we've devised some scientific methods to determine what effects Keith and Jerry might reasonably expect from their haphazard experiments with alcohol. We use test animals with definite amounts of alcohol. This animal has no alcohol in its system. You might compare it to a ginger ale drinker. This is an animal which has previously been injected with only enough alcohol to bring the level in its blood up to what it would be in a human being after drinking four beers. The third animal has received enough alcohol to bring its blood alcohol level up to a percentage comparable to that of heavy indulgence. Say, someone who had been holding down the fort all evening. What's the first one? The one without alcohol. His reflexes are fast and automatic. He immediately copes with the unusual situation. In number two, with a moderate amount of alcohol, his coordination seems to take more effort. He meets the unexpected situation less skillfully there's a perceptible decrease in his ability to balance. His reflexes are impaired. Now let's look at the third, the one well under the influence of alcohol. He meets the situation in a completely befuddled state. Note the complete inability to balance. This one is just not fit to cope with the situation. Yet he can walk away. Test animals aren't alone in showing these reactions. Let's take a walk over to a classroom where human reactions are being tested. Now let's see what would happen when driving under the influence of alcohol. To find out, we use the Aetna Driver Trainer. A unique teaching device with real car controls, the Driver Trainer employs a series of special instructional films to present actual on-the-road driving conditions, the drivers of these individual classroom cars have a driver's eye view of this motion picture highway. Let's imagine you're driving and haven't taken alcohol. Watch out for that delivery man. 
your rapid perception of the situation and quick brake reaction prevented what could have been a fatal accident. Now let's suppose you had done some drinking and are driving down the same road. You're driving a little too fast and have a false sense of confidence. Watch it. A few more feet might have meant tragedy. This time, let's imagine you're fully under the influence. Reflexes are slow, judgment poor, and you're too late and too slow to avoid hitting the delivery man. Your confidence was high, but your reactions and judgment were low. Yes, like animal number three here, when you're under the influence of alcohol, you keep on trying. You keep on thinking you can. Your coordination is low, but your confidence may be high. Certainly, Jerry Landon's confidence was high. There, I told you I could do it. And you ain't seen nothing yet. Jerry in front of an audience may be able to perform satisfactorily. But when he's alone and driving, he lets down and loses his concern, and therefore the safety factor. take Bill and Rita, and that's pretty far out. She'll be another half an hour late. Mm, and I promised Mother I'd be home early. Why don't you just patch things up with Jerry? I can't. He's gone already. Mm. Besides, I didn't want to ride with Jerry. He had too much to drink. Jerry's gone by himself? Gosh, he was kind of under the weather. Well, I didn't want him to go alone. I tried to get him to let me drive. You know, that worries me. Bev, you think I ought to go after him, see if he makes it home all right? Well, somebody ought to. I wish somebody would. But we've got to take Bill and Rita and Edie here. Well, if you go looking for Jerry, you'll never get home tonight. Something wrong here? Jerry's gone on home. And in his condition, we think somebody ought to catch up with him to make sure he gets there. And Edie's stranded. Well, we can go after him and we can take Edie with us. Uh, I think I might stay here and go with Dan. But I don't know if Bill and Rita are ready to go yet. Well, I'll go get the coat. I wish you two were ready to go. Keith's been drinking, too. Well, I don't think he's been drinking that much. I mean, enough to hurt anything. What do you think? I think it's all right. I'm not afraid to go with him. Well... Look, I can take you home now and come back for Bill and Rita. Well, that would be an awful lot of trouble. Maybe i better just call Mother and tell her I'll be late. Oh, come on and go with us. Besides, you'll make Keith mad by insinuating he's drunk. I guess so. Well, all right, fine. Here are your coats. Thank you. Now, you drive carefully tonight, please. Okay. Okay. You've made up your mind. Well, Keith, take it easy. Okay. Sure hope you find Jerry all right. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye Edie. Bye. Bye. By the time Dan and Bev had taken the other couple home, they felt much less apprehensive. They supposed Keith had caught up with Jerry in time. And then... Oh, what is it? Looks like an accident. You don't suppose it was Jerry? Keith should have been able to catch him by now. You wait here. I'll go see if I can help. Someone in the crowd up there had seen the state patrol stop a car that was weaving. But that was before the accident. I asked about it. 
The description fits Jerry's car. I guess he's safe. The police took him on in. Oh, thank heavens. For a minute there, I thought it was Jerry. But what's that you got there? My good luck piece. The one I gave Edie. She didn't want to ride with Keith. With Keith? I found it up there at the side of the road. Why didn't she stick to her guns? Why didn't she insist on riding with us? Why'd I let her go off with someone who'd been drinking? But Keith wasn't drunk. No, Keith wasn't drunk. No, Keith wasn't drunk the way Jerry was. Had he been, the police might have picked him up too. But Keith had just enough alcohol to slow his reactions in a critical moment. A moment that was to send him and Mary and Edie to the hospital. I know one thing, you can't trust to luck. If the driver's been drinking, you've got to stick to your guns and turn down the ride. Always. Nobody can afford to drive with alcohol present in the body. Today's heavy traffic and high-speed cars make the odds heavy against the non-drinking driver. Out of consideration for the safety of others and yourself, should you drive if you have been drinking recently? Should you ride with a driver who has? These decisions ought not to be difficult for you to make. I'm having a good time. Yeah? How are you feeling? I think this party's starting to get started. Yeah, we've watched some movies. We've had some beverages. You know, we've got these uh, glasses out here to make a nice example for you folks at home, but we're, uh, we're kind of half in the body bag at this point. <laughs> so to speak. Yes. You know, some more literally than others, but... So what, what comes up next in our repast of libation? Well, next, if you're really looking to step things up, we have a classic shooter called Brain Hemorrhage. Uh, Sounds perfect. I know I enjoy a nice brain hemorrhage every, any day of the week. So the way we're going to make this is we start with some peach schnapps. We're going to be very careful with this one because we've had a few at this point. Then you take your coffee liqueur, Irish cream, what have you. Yes, often it goes good in the coffee. In your very seasonal bottle, and just lightly, very lightly, drip a little down in there. Oh, and that looks like it's working just fine to uh, float on the top and kind of curdle Curdle there, get kind of pink and lumpy. Let's just look real close at that. So it's nice and coagulated there, nice and lumpy. It's starting to form there. Maybe we could even have a little bit more of that. Yeah. I think we can. Sometimes you oh, need yes. to use tools of the trade. Real medical equipment for yeah. your brain hemorrhage. Just get nice down in there. Ooh, beautiful. Nice and clotted and gross. Get a real spurt going. And then, for a little added effect, yep. for, you just want to shoot just a bit down in there. A nice bloody hemorrhage. Mm. There we are. See how we got our brain mass just kind of floating in there. And I don't want to step on the bartender's toes, but you know, gauntly sensibility says maybe we garnish this one with, uh, with that little syringe there. Load it up oh, with yeah. some more of the heart juice. There we are. Just load it on, set it on in there. Ooh. 
Looking good. There's our brain hemorrhage. Let's uh, maybe try that out. <laughs> now, you, typically you would you'd need to just throw this back, but you know that uh, Gauntly is uh, just about to head into Halloween season, as I said. Gauntly's got to have his wits about him. Gauntly's got to go to work shortly after we uh, tape here. Mmm. You can taste the curdling. You can taste the brain. All of my favorite drinks are coagulated, so. Mm. Tastes like uh, something out of the Dr. Dreadful Drink Lab. That is a throwback. Honestly, that uh, peach, it's a nice, uh, you know, it's like, uh, Holding your nose. It's like a spoonful of sugar to help the uh, bloody brains go down. Yeah, as the saying goes. Yeah. All right, so in the spirit of blood and brains, here's a little, uh, little something for you at home before we head into our final round. Enjoy. The game is over. Who's the loser? You are. You can be fined up to a thousand dollars, or lose your beer license, or that hurts. Beer is one of the most important products you sell, because two out of three families use beer as a beverage. Two out of three. The U.S. drinks one and a half billion cases a year. That's enough to fill a tank the size of a football field 15 miles high. A big sip of it comes through convenience stores. They depend on it to stay in business. The average store sells about $30,000 worth a year. But beer's not the only thing involved here. Chances are you will sell related items. Chips. Chip dip snack foods, and picnic supplies, and also non-related items, milk, bread, and who knows what. This is the way the store stays in business. Some young people would play games with your license. If you're careful, you get to keep it. If not, you're stuck with peanuts. It's not a game you want to lose. You have only two cards to play with. Valid identification and good judgment. But not a bad hand when you think about it. Take identification, for instance. The common driver's license is the best form of identification. Best if laminated. If not, it can be altered. Check this one closely. Does the description match? It doesn't always. In running a bluff, a person may wrinkle and soil his card. That's a good trick. It obscures alterations and makes it hard to read. If in doubt, ask for more ID, such as a selective service card, liquor purchase card, or anything federal or state in origin. 
The third group of numbers from the left is the year of birth. See anything wrong here? There is one other good identification card, the military ID card. Complete with picture and description. You know, some kids get pretty good at the game of deception. But employees get good at detecting their little games because they know their business is at stake. Be suspicious of youths who park at the side or rear of the store. and of youths who try to purchase beer quickly. Or those who try to hide their age. Don't allow yourself to be distracted. checked everything but her age. Be careful of women. Some have cheating hearts. And they're hard to detect. And hard to deny. No, I left my driver's license at home, along with my draft card. I don't I have my student identification well, card. It yeah, is state law ID. that I have some identification with your yes, age yeah. on it. And uh, it my picture's sophomore. there, and, and there's my mm. classification school sophomore, which would be evident that, that I'm that okay? I'm sorry, but state law requires that I have to have an identification with your age on it. Well, that's purposes. silly. Sir, we were I just in I here. Yeah, I was in here Saturday, right. And we bought a couple six-packs, and... Uh, he didn't have any trouble. He What's the they didn't ask me for an ID. No, then. he didn't ask me for an identification. Well, we usually do. And, uh, you don't believe I'm 18? I'm a poor judge of age. I need some valid identification. Okay, well, my father comes in here. He's like 45, and he doesn't have his identification. Well, with he can't buy the beer. Well, like I said, I, I could tell someone who's 45. Or, oh. But with you, I'd like to have uh, some identification with your I age. really feel insulted. That's I really silly. do. Well, this not only protects us, but it also protects you. I really don't Those who protest the most are usually under age. Don't give in to poor logic. Listen, sir. Listen, sir. Watch out during periods of peak attempts, weekends, holidays, graduations, and dance nights. Be alert at all times, especially when busy. Many stores have devices which serve to prevent, warn, and discourage attempts at illegal purchase of beer. Warning signs. Birthday charts. They eliminate the confusion of computing age. Sworn statements of age help sometimes. They may help prove age and protect your store. They also give the employee a check of signature against their ID. But for the most part, people will feel uneasy about signing their name, affirming that they are an age they're not. I don't think I want to sign anything. I'm sorry, buddy. No ID. You don't sign that. No beer. Wrong. In refusal, always be courteous. Teenagers are good customers, some of your best. You can't sell them beer, but you don't want to lose the rest of their business either. I'm sorry, but without proper identification, I can't sell you the beer. Right. Chances are he didn't lose a customer this time. How about putting this back where you got it, buddy? Wrong. Never embarrass needlessly. You lost him again. 
Uh, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Thank you. Right. Teenagers, they usually live nearby, will be of legal age soon. Then, if you're courteous, you'll still have their business. Americans love their leisure time. And convenience stores with their quick shopping supply of beverages and related foods contribute to the nation's enjoyment of leisure time. Some stores report that beer amounts to as much as 20% of their total volume. That's good business. You can strengthen your hand by carefully checking ID on doubtful customers, by being courteous and friendly, and by cooperating with local law enforcement officials. Remember, the only way to play this game is according to Hoyle. And your best bet is to obey the law. This film is for informational purposes only and does not purport to give legal advice. Since laws may vary from state to state, you are cautioned to obtain legal guidance concerning local laws. All right. Guess we're filming, still filming. Yeah, yeah we're still here. Okay. There we are. Well, it's not quite. Not quite quitting time yet. So you got anything else in your pantheon? Well, I do have one more drink for you, and um, I don't think any Halloween party would be complete without a little Monster Mash, which is the title of our next drink. For a drink suitable for Bobby Boar's picking himself, we have some candy corn infused moonshine. Candy corn moonshine. Breathe that in, guys. So first, you want to take your moonshine. Just any standard moonshine. If you know someone with a still, don't tell the don't tell the feds. Tell me. So the the key the key thing for uh, for the moonshine is it's corn whiskey, um, essentially similar to bourbon, but before they put it in a barrel or age it, it's just raw and it's clear and it's powerful. And as you said, maybe your friends make some in their backyard. Yeah. So you just want to pour your moonshine in there. And uh, the recipe calls for. Hold it together. Just got one last scene. <laughs> recipe calls for five candy corns per ounce of moonshine. So just want to count them out. So you know, if you put five ounces in there, you're going to put 25. If you got 10 ounces in there, you're going to put 50. And if you got a whole bottle, you just put a whole bunch of candy corns in there. Maybe some of those pumpkins, whatever. If it's malty and you're just into celebrating the spirit of Halloween-ish times, the fall harvest season, and um, grain in general. I can actually already smell it coming off. Mm -hmm. So there we go. Yeah, just take a good whiff of that. You can, you can smell the uh, varnish coming off <laughs> from that uh, 100 proof liquor in there. And so what this is going to do, well, what is this going to do? Well, we want to seal that up. Just put it out overnight, let it marinate, let those uh, flavors sink into the moonshine. Now, we don't have all night, so I had some whipped up last night that's ready now. If you can see... It's got sort of a brownish color to it because we put some of the chocolate ones in, but that just adds a little extra flavor, I think. Yeah, yeah. Makes it a little more fun. Uh, so this is called an infusion, when you soak, soak stuff in the liquor to kind of have one absorb the other, have one color and influence the other and brainwash it a little bit. That smells like moonshine, I'm not going to lie. Give that a little... Little malty taste here. Yeah, yeah. At home, if you're interested, if you uh, fish out just the orange and yellow ones, you should have a little bit more vibrant color. 
But this has got a vibrant taste. I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's got a bit of an aftertaste. It's a little chocolatey, and a little moonshiny. Okay, so, seems as though we're coming up on the, uh, the end of our program here, not too far out. But, stay tuned with Count Gauntlet. We may wrap it here. I will say pleasant nightmares. But I don't know if I'll tack it on to the end of this show. Tack it on to YouTube, maybe at the start of our Halloween episode next month. But I'm at that place now where I'm ready to tell you some stories. You ready for some stories? Oh, I'm ready for some stories. The game is over.